Soldiers' footprints, leaving their mark on a nation. Footprints in the mud, footprints in the snow, footprints at the altar in Aydin, Germany. Footprints across France and Belgium, Holland through Zundert, then from Aachen to Berlin. Up in Holland, I left footprints in the mud, red with another man's blood. Framations Art Gallery is proud to honor our veterans from the greatest generation. This multimedia art exhibit includes a collection of paintings, photographs, and mixed media artwork that explores the theme of patriotism, independence, and those brave souls in the military that protect these ideals. This exhibit also includes a multimedia compilation of war memorabilia intended to honor our veterans and inspire and support our current active military. Each item has a story of its own to tell. Some of the items are on loan from the family of deceased World War II veteran Luke U. Patton, who served in the 104th Infantry, also known as the Timberwolves. In the years after the war, Patton found solace through writing, using his experiences in the war as both inspiration and a method of healing. He found that by putting the horrors he witnessed down on paper, he could not only keep those memories alive as a reminder of a terrible time, but also as a way of getting past it. He received the Silver Star, among other medals, for his bravery in the war. One of his uniforms, as well as several army garrison caps, newspaper articles about him, and stories he has written are on display. Luke Patton was a lifetime member of the American Legion and the Disabled American Veterans. This exhibit also features a retelling of some of Patton's stories. A portion of the proceeds from the sales in this exhibit will be donated to the local chapter of the Disabled American Veterans to aid the programs that they offer to our local veterans. The Disabled American Veterans, formed in the years following World War I as our veterans returned home from the war to a country that was not prepared to meet their needs. Programs were developed to help veterans find work, rehabilitation for their injuries, as well as a voice in political issues. This is an organization that is run strictly on the funds brought in through membership and public donations. We invite the public to support this noble cause. For more information about the DAV, please visit their website at DAV.org. Following are letters and stories from the Patton Family Archives. The Hero in My Family, written by Casey Stillman. The Hero in My Family, by Casey Stillman. The Hero in My Family is my great uncle, Luke Patton. He served in World War II in the 104th Infantry Division from 1942 to 1945. They were called the Timberwolves. The Timberwolves were involved in heavy combat on the front line for 6 months and 18 days. They spearheaded five major offensive operations and always met their objectives on time. The Timberwolves were a good team and their specialty was bold night attacks which allowed them to hold casualties to 1,445 killed, 4,801 wounded, 111 missing in action for a total of 6,357. One of the things I like about Great Uncle Luke is he enjoys talking about the war and sharing his stories with others. Also, he was a great writer about the war. My Great Uncle Luke is very brave and is not afraid of getting his hands dirty. He has done a lot of courageous things, knocked in doors to save prisoners of war, he has blown up a panzer tank, carried out an injured man that died on his back, saved another man's life, and was shot at. He still has one of his original dog tags, and lost the other in Holland. He still wears his dog tag. He also wears the soldier's cross that his mother sent him when he was training in the States. She sent it to him to keep him safe and more. Uncle Luke believes, the good Lord saved me to do for somebody somewhere. I am glad he fought for our country. He had a lot of good times and bad. He is a very kind man, even after all he has been through in the war. I am very proud of my great Uncle Luke. Soldier's Footprints Yes, footprints in the mud, footprints in the snow, footprints at the altar in Inden, Germany, footprints across France, Belgium, Holland, through Zundert, then from Aachen to Berlin. Up in Holland, I left footprints in the mud, red with another man's blood. One night, we walked for miles up a levee. We found out we walked right up in among enemy troops. 
I walked right past a horse-drawn cannon. I mean, by this time, all hell had broke loose. We got an order to get out and withdraw if we could. Bernard Taylor from Mount Vernon, Illinois, was hit bad. Paralyzed, but wasn't out. I asked him where he was hit. He didn't know. He was numb all over. I told him I was going to get him back to the aid station, and they would patch him up and send him back to the States. He would be out of the war. He informs me to get myself out and forget him. He wouldn't make it anyway. This made me more determined I would get back for help. I got him over my back, holding his legs with my left arm, carrying a rifle with the other. He told me several times that what I was doing was wasting time. He would not live. The road we went in on was cut off by the enemy. Out through Swampland was the only way out. They shelled that swamp. They didn't intend for anyone to get out. He got hit with shrapnel while on my back. In fact, I still have some small pieces in my back from that night. What Bernard Taylor got from that shell, he died within minutes while on my back. I still carried him out of the swamp, laid him on top of the levee side of the road. His blood ran from shoulders to my shoes. When I laid him down, I felt for heartbeat and pulse. There was no sign of life, so I left him to lay beside the road, east of Zunder, Holland. Then we moved over to Aachen, Germany, where we relieved the big red one on the first U.S. Army spearhead. We fought all the way through Rohr Industrial Valley. It was a hard way to go. The enemy fought fiercely to hold. We fought all the way up to Lukerberg, which put us on high ground overlooking the Rohr River. And then it snowed another heavy snow on top of the first snow. By this time, the Battle of the Bulge started. The enemy went all the way up in Belgium, Brussels, Liege, all the way to Seaport in Antwerp, Belgium. This area we cleared before moving out of Holland. By this time, the Americans launched a counterattack against the enemy, General Patton's tanks and all. At this time, we held what we had gained. In December 1944, the sky cleared. They put everything in the air that would fly. I remember one morning, one... One glance at the sky, seven bombers at one time going for dirt. Out of the seven, only one crew from one plane made it to the ground. You can't imagine how grateful those men were to know they had made it to the earth alive. They were all hit with shrapnel, all able to walk. I showed them the way and how far to the aid station. All were able to walk on their own power, but when they walked in the snow, they left a trail of blood in the snow. This went on and on. I've seen men still walking with feet froze up to their knees. The enemy was shooting our planes out of the sky. It looked like ducks dropping out of the sky. Their aircraft guns were around Cologne, Germany. This was about 12 miles east of us, with Christmas Day coming up. On Christmas Eve, it was clear and cold. They send up word to us that next morning there would be church service back down the hill in Enden, Germany. Anyone wishing to go was welcome. Expressions never changed. Not a word from anyone. All I saw was grim faces that looked like I felt. But leave it to me, I had to go and say something. I said, hell, I'll go, but no one offered to go with me. So that morning, I took my rifle, some extra hand grenades, and started to walk down to Enden. A pair of dead horses lay in the street, dead bodies lying everywhere. So when I got to the rock church, part of the roof gone, no heat, about 30 below. I walked in the church, G.I.s sitting there with steel helmets on, rifles between their knees ready to jump and run on split-second notice. I sat down, and in about 60 seconds, the chaplain was reading from a book when a shell hit the church. The chaplain was the only man who got hit. It almost knocked him down, but he closed the book. His face turned fire red. He walked away from the altar and fell. This story I've told many times. Here was a man trying to help troubled minds with torn hearts that gave his all for you and the red, white, and blue. He left his last footprints at the altar in Inden, Germany on Christmas morning, 1944. He will always be remembered by all who knew him as a great chaplain. I've seen many good men leave this old world. Sometimes it makes one wonder what is life and death all about. I saved a man's life up in Holland, 1944. I sent him back on a stretcher and never knew whether he lived or died. Thirty-five years later, I met him in Williamsburg, Virginia. He was grateful as hell for what I did for him. Here it is, forty-five years after WW2, and I still get cards and letters from these men. These are some of the things that are very rewarding. To this day, when people show their kindness and appreciation, it makes life worthwhile. Several years ago, while at the 104th reunion in San Francisco, California, I was talking to a public relations man from Washington, D.C. that covers military re reunions all over the country. 
He mentioned that he sees something with this organization that he did not see with other groups. He did not see the close brotherhood relations with others that he saw with this group. I explained to him, these men are remnants left over from a combat team that had served a hitch in hell. No one can visualize or understand. These men have been down a hard, dark, cold, and lonely road covering each other's backs, saving one another's lives, and they will never forget. A Soldier's Dream We had been on the move day and night through France, Belgium, and Holland. Pulled out of Holland to relieve the 1st Infantry Division on the 1st U.S. Army Spearhead. We ended up on the Russian front south of Berlin. Somewhere between Cologne and Berlin, we walked day and night in the rain, wet, cold, and dog-tired. We moved off a road into a field creek between the road and the railroad track. We dug foxholes in the rain just deep enough to get your head below ground level. By the time I got a hole dug, it had water standing in the bottom, but got in at least maybe to stay alive. We prayed, wishing and longing for this war to come to its end, just hoping to go home and be able to live and love again, but sometime it seemed it would never end. When I got in this foxhole, so tired, wet, and cold, and fell asleep under these conditions. Another soldier shook me, woke me up, and said, They're moving tanks in on us. I stayed awake long enough to hear three tanks move up to where they could fire under the railroad trestle. They fired those 88s point blank at us. I could hear the men in charge giving the firing order. One, two, three, fire. They fired those 88s at us. Machine guns covered the bottom land and under these conditions fell asleep and had the sweetest dream I ever had in my life. The war was over and I was back home in a nice warm bed with my wife. This dream was so real that when I woke up I couldn't believe that I was still here in the rain. I didn't get aggravated too much. What I got from the dream I accepted as a message from the Lord that I would see the end of the war and go home. There isn't a day goes by that I think back to just how lucky I have been. But what is sad in my mind, of all the soldiers, young men, 18, 20 years old, that we left behind. But there's a little bright side about this. All we knew, we had lost a lot of men. Some killed, some captured or wounded. But after 40 years, some of these men are showing up, and this is one of the greatest pleasures of my life. Just to hear that they are still with us. At least it shows it wasn't all dark. These men are the greatest people I've ever known. We have been down a very dark, cold, and lonely road together. We will never forget. There is one thing that people can't understand. When men endure hardships such as we did together, you get so close you think alike. You seem to become one body. We all had the same thing in common. Stay alive and for the war to end. Eibelschausen, Germany. World War II. Just a line to say hello. I'm sending you a picture of the jeep that First Lieutenant Thompson and Driver were heading a convoy of L Company 415th Infantry, 104th Division, consisting of one jeep, five tanks, and several trucks heading into Eibelschausen, Germany, March 30th, 1945. Just as we topped a hill, we could see a railroad trestle at the bottom of a hill and the town across the track to our right. As we topped the hill, they hit us hard and fast. Lieutenant Thompson and Clarence Eckert were the first hit by machine gun fire. They were killed on the spot. They hit three tanks with APs. We had infantrymen riding on the outside. The enemy killed the tank crews. Not one infantryman on the outside got a scratch. They fired an 88 at the truck I was riding on and missed. It seemed like that shell came within three inches of my head. I sprang on my feet, with one jump over the side of the truck, landed in the road ditch, moved back down the road to get away from the truck. I knew they would hit it again. They shelled the hell out of us. This was about 4 p.m. in the evening. I could hear a big one coming in. The sound was like it would hit me in the back, but it missed. It landed in the bottom of a V ditch about three feet in front of my head. I died a thousand deaths waiting for that damn thing to blow. Thank God it didn't. If it had, I would have stayed in Germany. So that night it got dark as the hubs of hell. It got so quiet. It was scary, nothing moving. No sound of any kind except us guys moving slow and quiet. We started moving into the town slow. Seemed to me it must have been about midnight. We walked up on the west side of that house on the picture. We could see that tank across the fence. Sergeant Marion Smart said, hit him with a bazooka in the side. I said, that won't work, I have to get it in the rear. This was where Sergeant Harold Schmidt got in the act of getting the rear guard about 75 to 100 feet behind the tank. I pulled the pins on three rounds, put one in the bazooka, carried two rounds in my hand with the pins pulled ready to go to work. I was asked who I would take with me. I said no one. If I get out on the streets behind the tree and hit the tank and get back, I'll be lucky. 
Besides, one man is half the target of two men. I heard that guard halt Sergeant Schmidt, who hit the enemy soldier with a forty-five grease gun. By this time, when I moved out from behind the tree and hit the tank in the rear, they started the engine and it died. The starter buzzed, but it didn't start. By this time, I hit him two times. When I put the third round in and looked up to fire, the tank was burning. I gave him the third round for good measure. I must have been 30 to 35 feet behind a tree to the left of the sidewalk. Each time I hit the tank, metal flew back and hit the tree. By the time I hit him with the second round, it was starting to burn. I gave him the third round for good measure, for I needed to get rid of this SB with the pins pulled. So the heat set that 88 gun off. It had a shell in the barrel that we never thought about. I was in front of that damn tank when it went off. It must have missed me by three feet. The good lord was looking out for me. By this time, enemy soldiers were coming out of this house that we captured. When we hit the tank, everything had gotten quiet until we hit that tank. Then things started happening until daylight. The next morning, we had most of the big stuff knocked out. Still had sniper fire. We absorbed the enemy lines for they didn't know where their front line was. It was daylight the next morning when three men in a command car came up the street right past the tank. I started hitting the command car in the road with an M1 rifle. It wasn't stopping the car until he got about even with me. I hit the driver through the driver door. I mean, that was when it stopped. They came out with their hands in the air. Glad they did. Any one of them could have cut me in two with 9mm burp guns. You see, we had a busy night. The driver was grateful as hell he didn't get hit in the head or the chest. Only hit in the ass. He dropped his pants and showed me where I hit him through both cheeks of his ass. He couldn't have done it anymore. Even if you had measured him and fired an M1 rifle to make it even on both sides. He gave me his pistol, pocket knife, three boxes of condoms because he said he was a POW and he wouldn't need any of this stuff. He was grateful as hell he wasn't killed, so I sent him back to our rear. You know, as bad as war was, there was always some humor come out of things that happened. I suppose this is what kept us from going off our rocker. Or maybe we were and didn't realize it. For this act of something or other, they awarded me with a silver star. The following letter was written by Cadet Kevin L. Geisberg to Luke Patton on January 15th, 1990. January 15th, 1990. Dear Mr. Patton, One night in early January 1989, I was driving along I-70 just outside of St. Louis, Missouri and decided to stop at a truck stop and get some chow. I sat down and ordered my food, and as I looked around, I happened to see an old salty-looking man enter, and I noticed him wearing a green jacket with a Timberwolves patch on it. Wouldn't you know that this hero sat down and talked to me, a cadet, for about two hours. He told me about when he was in the Great World War II. He showed me his silver star, and he gave me copies of Soldier's Cross World War II. These copies of your account of WW2 are a possession I regard as high as I do the book my grandfather gave me about the 29th Blue Gray Division, the unit he served in in World War I. I look at our maker and ask myself, why do men give their lives for this country? Why did men like Bernard Taylor die for the USA? Kids these days never think of those real heroes. Why do they look up to some drug-abusing athlete instead of the men of the VFW? In May 1990... I will be commissioned second lieutenant of the United States Army, the best in the world. Mr. Patton, it is men like you who I thank for paving the way for young men like me to follow. Your gallantry has made my freedom possible. Someday I hope to have the privilege of combat so me and the men I lead can preserve freedom for your grandchildren. I read your essays often, and I thank God for what I have. I have to thank you, too. Someday, if I die and meet your buddies during the war, I'll thank them, too. God bless you. Sincerely, Kevin L. Geisbert, Cadet USA, Wentworth Military Academy. The artist of the Soldiers' Footprints exhibit each shared a personal story about their connection to a veteran who had left a footprint in their life. We will always remember and never forget the sacrifices. Here is a very special thank you to all of the men and women who have served our country. Your bravery and selflessness will never be forgotten. Can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming? Whose bright stripes and bright stars Through the perilous fight O'er the rampart 
once we wash were so gallantly screaming and the rocket's red glare the bounds bursting in air gave proof through the that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled banner yet wave oh, the land God bless America, land that I love, stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. The mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with
God bless America, land that I love, stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above.